Well, welcome to the festival. Um, this is Chaos in the Culture. It's a poetry panel. Um, today we have uh, Tarfia, uh, who's going to be our moderator. She's the author of Registers of Illuminated Villages. Uh, we've also got Joy Priest, who's the author of Horsepower. Um, Vivi Francis, who will be joining us soon, who's the author of Forest Primeval. Uh, Francine J. Harris, who's the author of Here is the Sweet Hand. And Mag Gabbert, who's the author of uh, Minimal Poems. Um, so yeah, um, Terfia, feel free to take it away. Thanks so much, Catherine. Uh, welcome, y'all. Good morning to everybody. Thanks for joining us on this Saturday. Um, I'm going to be moderating this panel. Some quick logistics. Um, please do use the chat to shower our readers with praise. Um, some options are heart emojis. You can also shout out lines that they are going to be potentially sharing with us with their talented, wonderful selves. So please do use the chat. Hi, Vivi. Yay. Welcome. Hi. Um, Hi. So happy to see everybody. <laughs> so happy to see you. Uh, I'm just running through a couple of just like the standard logistical Zoomlandia things. Um, I don't have anything else to say, but really excited that y'all are all here. I'm really excited to hear our wonderful authors. And our first reader is going to be Mag Gabbert. Um, Mag holds a PhD in creative writing and teaches uh, at SMU and for writer writing workshops Dallas. And she is the author of Minimal Poems, a chapbook and runs a really cool zine series y'all should check out as well. And Hi, hi everybody. Thank you for being here. Also awkward note, but there are a couple like other folks signed in, I guess, with under Mag Gabbert. And so I just wanted to note that like whoever is writing in the chat under Mag Gabbert is not me, Mag Gabbert, which is strange. Um, <laughs> But nevertheless, I appreciate that note. Um, thank you so much, Tarfia, for inviting me to be part of this panel. It's just a real um, honor and privilege to be reading with um, Vivi and um, Francine and Joy. OK, so I'm going to read three poems. These are new poems. They are chaotic in some ways. Um, and the first poem is called Crack. One of my dad's favorite jokes starts like this. I can't believe they got back together after all that shit. Some nights he just left and when I tried to reach him, I'd hear the silence my head makes when I swallow my own spit. Cracked voices, codes, smiles, doors, cases, books, cans, bones, glasses, bones, cracks taken at, slipped past, sound of a bullet, some nights I listened for tires or the slam of our screen door until morning broke in. Cracks, siblings in English, a list. Rook, grackle, castle, crow. When dad rolled down the window to hold out his cigarette, the rush of cold air always scattered my breath, like stones pressed in a nest of black ants. Yes, my dad smoked it. My friends wonder if I struggle to date men because I notice too many faults in them. Sometimes I imagine asking dad why he went to prison. Assault with a deadly weapon, assault on family by threat, emergency call interference. I imagine his side of that story. The punchline involves butt cheeks. Dad used to lay shirtless down our long hallway for weeks, yelling to me, Smelly, come help me. Smelly, I'm dying. Always this space between the person we are and the person we want to be. Derived from the Greek, to split, Sanskrit, knife, Latin, void, empty, and old church Slavonic, skyfe. You see, the nature of crack is to crack between the narrative. I was a kid. He always claimed he was dying. I didn't know how to help him. Step in a hole, you'll break your mother's sugar bowl. Step on a nail, put your father in jail. 
Okay, the second poem I'm going to read comes from um, a zine that Tarfia and I actually released in February, an anti-Valentine zine of sonnets, and um, this poem is called Dear Gun. Every time I try to get laid, why does my phone think I'm about to be fired upon? Like, hey, let's duck. Duck! Hang on. Another school year has begun. The stores have bullet-sized tampons. It's hunting season. And yet again, I'm staying out of sight. Float, dive. You see, the best sex of my life was with a man who just shot blanks. I like the game, but not the risks. I like to play. Wasn't it Dickinson who claimed her life had once gone stiff, had been a loaded gun? Do you think she meant life's a dick? If so, what's death? What's the opposite of a man? A woman, a wound, the devil's image? <clears throat> All right, and this is gonna be my last poem. It is called Goat. Because every man I've ever slept with has wandered off to have kids but later fucked me again. Because I can't seem to pick a religion. Because during sex ed, my teacher showed us a little box with an open slot on her desk, told us to write down our questions and slip them in. Because the first note read, does sex really make women scream? Because the ancient Greek word tragoidia, which meant goat song, somehow turned into the modern English tragedy because my dad's nickname for me is Smelly. Because for a long time, I heard the word bleat as bleed. Because this song is sweet, it is sweet. Because God told his people to bring him two goats. He said they should give one their sins and let it go and they should slit the other's throat. Because my brother claims he needs a new razor for manscaping. Because childless mothers are called nannies because Jesus won't help me. And one night when a friend and I were 15, we took a late train to a faraway party and a man approached us whispering, would you rather be stabbed or sliced? Because hell is an animal with other animals inside it. Because every choice I've made involved sacrifice because I'm always the one that got away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mag. That was wonderful. So great to hear those poems out loud and good to see your cat for a second too. Um, okay, moving on. Thank you again so much. Our next reader is Joy Priest, who is the author of Horsepower, winner of the Donald Hall Prize in Poetry. She's also a doctoral student at the University of Houston currently in creative writing and just overall a luminescent being that um, everybody should know. Thank you so much, Joy. Oh no, I've not been on mute this whole time. I hope I wasn't making noises. Um, thank you, Tarfia, for um, inviting me on this panel with, wow, like I'm so, I'm nervous and I've like read like probably 600 times in the last five months, but this panel makes me nervous because I love everyone here. Um, yeah, so one of the things that Tarfia wrote to us when she invited us to read was, you know, like the theme of um, chaos uh, and the culture and, and how that could be like writing that might be affected by the chaos of what continues to be referred to as this moment. And um, as a student, as like a fan of Walter Benjamin, I, this moment for me is like five centuries or so years long. So I just thought like, uh, what, what are my poems kind of like, is in conversation with that idea. Um, I'm gonna read three poems. The first one is A Personal History of Breathing. We woke to life in the 80s, the air dying from industry and industry dying. Train brakes groaning to a stop in that singular scent of horses, the muscular lather and manure moving down river to Mississippi. Our grandfathers chain smoked viceroys in the house and we developed asthma before vocabulary, read books and held our breath, spelled but didn't speak. In our bodies, humidity thickened into an argument with speech. 
When we joined our father's households, they trashed our plastic bags packed tight with medicine bottles and inhalers, curated over the years by our mothers who smothered us, our fathers said, mumbling something under their breath about being a man. We were daughters. We were black and so sons too. They vowed to make us stronger, big lunged, lit our cigarettes, handed us grip pleated paper bags in place of pills. In the 90s springtime, we suffered through neon particles of pollen, suction film like to all blooming surfaces, innocuous and in natural purpose, but perverted by a chemical monopoly modifying plant sex and the work of bees. We became allergic to apples because we were allergic to apple trees. At the plant, our fathers were talking their co-workers out of the Ku Klux Klan while we hooped on our still segregated basketball teams, outgrowing childhood over an ironed rim summer at parks oxidized to rust. At 14, we went to work at drive through windows, fried batter air settling in our hair, black and mild smoke breaks freaked to extend time. And some of us went off to college with polluted memories. And some of us ended up at the school clinic with anxiety and traumatic stress, acid reflux and lactose intolerance, the nurses said was genetic. We didn't have the phrase environmental racism yet. And sometimes we just forgot to breathe or realize we've been holding our breath. We tried kombucha and herbal teas, yoga and meditation, signed up for classes with suburban moms on Xanax and Ambien, and we acted brand new. Until a man hawking cigarettes, second shift side hustling like our fathers, stopped breathing on a sidewalk. A man who talked to plants like our fathers stopped breathing in this state sanctioned chokehold. And we found ourselves pacing the brain yard on a cocaine flight, unable to locate our lungs, left arms going numb saying, this is it, this is it with our heartbeats running out leaping and winning and lying down long nosed in the grass, huffing, panting out the train of our childhood, chugging backward to a slow stop in our minds come to take us to the afterlife. It's ghostly porters, maskless, finally, leaning over us with our father's faces, reaching toward us with a bag to breathe into the trail of white buttons down their uniforms, like a blinding current peeking through. Um, this next poem is called Bass, and it follows the, the when I was, when I was started teaching myself to play the bass, um, you know, like when you learn an instrument, there are the mnemonics for like the fretboard, the notes of the board or whatever, and, and um, the notes of the bass is E, A, D, G, and one of the uh, mnemonics I came across was Eva ate dynamite good, and I really love that because one of my favorite things is like, learning about a woman who plays the bass um and it's also kind of why I want to play it because it, it seems like an instrument that's like oh girls don't play that you know and um so I just like kind of leaned into the mnemonic um you can kind of listen for the EA DG across the form bass <clears throat> Eva ate dynamite good like a tear gas brigade on a runaway night her genre, black meadow, her sound maroon, her imitators pale as any cloud in the Versailles world. Eva already done got down. Eva already done got, it worked out, like a remedy for terror in our new carceral courtyard. My favorite little agitator, my pluck, my thread of mine. Eva ain't dim gas. Eva ain't devil, ain't dust, always dropping goods. Eva always breathing drums. Goodness gracious, Eva ain't. Eva ain't. Eva ate dynamite good. Eva armed defense garland, departed genealogy, escort, slide notes, paraffin, fret fingers. Eva ate doggone. Also should say like before I wrote this poem, I was reading Francine's uh, Where is the Sweet Hand? And I just really, I don't know, like um, in the first poem of the book, the poem, the word versal, 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 versal word like stop me. And um so that so that I should probably you know acknowledge that the influence of that poem on on bass. Um, my last poem is a new poem I've never read before, so we'll see how it goes. Um, it's called "The Black Outside." It has an epigraph. The enclosure is so brutal, Sadia Hartman, and uh, she said that in a talk with Fred Moulton, I think in 2018, called uh, at Duke University, called "The Black Outdoors." 
but I've just been kind of working with this idea of the black outside. And um, I feel inspired to read it because last night in this talk Vibe had uh, uh, someone asked about the, the, the um, blackness in the interior in her work, um, the wilderness inside. And I just thought like that was like sort of the same thing, but in different language. Um, uh, the black outside, the enclosure is so brutal, Sadia Hartman. The jazz puts you on a swing in your project neighborhood where you learn the antithesis of ownership, where you learn to live with the loudness of your neighbor's living. It brings an ecology of sincerity, the thought of the black outside. And you believe that shit. You believe the hollowed out trunks, the treehouse of our speech, the way we say things. Had to quit carrying on with folks who don't have a history of being hidden or community plumbing issues. Done with jazzless folks who ask why you still have feelings. You're being wayward with us now in the black outside. The jazz puts you on a swing in the gentry's neighborhood, which used to be your neighborhood, where you pinned your personality on a shared clothesline, where you placed your speaker in the courtyard window to bring us out on a swivel now in the bureaucratic fabric, on a walk you've taken to escape the mind so close to itself it cannot see itself, like the eyes above the nose. What doesn't pursue you? Now you are even after yourself. On that walk all the way to Wa and back down worrying about the way you looked feeling unstable on the inside, you wrote from above yourself. And on it Van Buren where you turned back toward Montrose Boulevard, there it was in Olive Buick, stalled in the median, and suddenly you were in the black outside. Dear beloved in the future, are you still maroon? Lover, are you there? Am I there too? Thank you. Woo. Wow, the truth will really slow you down. Thank you so much, Joy, that was beautiful. Um, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Our next reader is Francine J. Harris, who is the author of Here is the Sweet Hand, which just won the 2021 National Book Critics Circle Award like two nights ago. I'm so proud of yeah. you and I'm so happy for you. Congratulations. You. Um, Francine is also the author of Play Dead and Allegiance. All of these books are wonderful. You also check it out. Francine, thank you. Thank you, Terfia, for having me. This is. Uh... A nice thing to wake up to. Um, I love that reading, Joy <laughs> and Mag. Um, Ivy, thank you for reading with me. Um, I'm gonna read an older poem and a couple new poems from the book. And I guess the only thing I really wanna say about these poems is that in thinking about this panel, I was thinking about control and agency, which I imagine we can talk about later. Wounded this way it aches. I am wounded and I want the cat call. I want it. Heads hanging out the window, bombinating past ass when I tralala grocery, when I leisure to mailbox, when I strut cobblestone to make laundromat, ache for it. I want the old wolf whistle, the bench stoop cubic, a measuring tape with the Paul Mall and his lip doing the curbside cry. I like it, like windshield wipers all over rain. I'm broke again and I want to get hitched at the liquor store looking for a wheelchair pimp with the blow pop. The street is empty without him. I am missing the men to dismiss. No one to fight with, crude dick. Of course, one could argue the dip in the back starts to feel dug out. You walk, they walk, you, sl you slide, they slow mechanic articulate alongside like wind up remote robotic lean low and glimmering teeth with whatever line they can muster in between sunspots and speech. They triangulate duos, three-piece, quarter son, quintet, sextet, octogenarian. They stumble if you trip them. Oh, street serenade, sing songing, ooh, don't be so mean in between the clearing and bus stop. The first holler I get, I might for strip. I won't beg. I have before. I took off a skin. 
I put it in paint. I tried to make it better with me than doing it alone. I won't fall off. The escape is shaky. It looks out over boys driving cars with toy black remotes. They are actually men. They are men in the wide zoom of street. Engine makes them hug. They trade the remotes loud over bright green skins. I won't panic. The plastic so fat and wide it can get in a lane. It can do a 180. I won't sick. It's a lump in the throat. When the dirt bikes head out in a rip to twilight, they hop off. I won't jump as they tilt a ruddy thing and hand it over to the next. The chest is sore right there. I won't beg. The blast of generators spits out dirty white light. A white man on the train with enormous eyes puts his fingers in the shape of a gun and shot another white man twice in the face. Before he deboarded, he said, fuck white supremacy, you're all gonna pay and I won't body, I won't block. I am putting the tip of his finger to my forehead. I won't yank. When I open the door, I am the whole brick wall. It's impossible angle. I am looking out the window at night against the glare of light. I can only see the men who ground in voices. Um, this poem is called, So Is We Thinking Up New Ways to Fuck or No, nah? which is, should become apparent is after the Ty Dollar Sign song. I got a lot to thrash. I don't mind sending it. I'ma make this point and I'ma snake you off. I'd be lying if I said this ain't for thumb. All these snafus in my skin, they turn you on. It's a lot of grope and mist unwraps the shit I'm on. Heard, you hot. The type you take bone to hog is we queening when we need this done as song. I ain't lending as for nothing, want to see the drug I'm on. I'm a cock, this throttle you could give me. Rain for God, would you dyke the day I wet my tongue with ta? You can hide your face until you most succumb. I ain't spinning, we can get the gist and then we throat a song, come sickum, stretch a bully on a prong. I'm not the flight, you crawl back up a star. But the way you wrap around me is rather mob. Ain't nobody trying to save you. May we get that langa. Got probably knots of other riches on these labia. So we pushing scented nude. Had to paint a spot to save us. Shook fur in them glitches. Gun dirt to the air of night as fable. We wrecking six as demirep. We trying to take the flitch as breath. We trying to keep the spruces debt. We trying to buck their gender vins. So you gonna fix it with these flatheads? Pearl or saw scale me. Is you kneeling under sun with muscle, heat or raw? Don't stay with loss. You know we're better off in a bug than a seal, hun. We can say it all. Is we sealing bouts of honey? So raw. We can steely run a grip that's flawed. Can I sling another niche that's ma? Is you with the shits or faw or craw blue law? Would you hide with a digger rickshaw? Would you die for the trick cum shaw? Would you sigh for a bigger macaw? Bylaw, hooks law. Can you steely and flip and claw? Can I bring another fitch or na? Is you with the ritz or na? Outlaw, scufflaw. Would you? Would you high with the whip and bra? Would you die with the vigor gig giga? Would you sigh for a swigger pshaw ring ta world? Make that class rap on young scholars spine. You already go gunning for a song of wine. I could slide into glycol with belly. Sweet Siro's asinar gets messy. Hurled is you trucking tree or suckling bee or caw. Can I sling another stitch? Death has a sea slum, seek brain, twos, a streak, go move it, or yaw, quiz, which me looking at, who stick in diff or flaw, who's a mag or a pie glitch, do raw ten or thaw, the way to do, plot a side dish, skew fallen and crawl, you gonna make them eggs cheesy with them grits or nah, 
then blue woo it right back on this script and voila, ta-da, oola. Man, I am sitting on such a good cry. Um, mashallah, thank you so much for me. That was the thank audacity. You. How dare you? That was incredible. Thank you so much. Um, man, okay. Uh, and our final reader is Vibe Francis. And Vibe Francis is the author of Blue Tail Fly, Horse in the Dark and Forest Primeval, winner of the Kingsley Tufts Award. Vibe, I just, I'm so excited to hear you read. I'm so excited you're joining us. Um, the, the excitement is mine. And um, I, I want to uh, just uh, hit the previous readers because, <laughs> because I'm gonna read after that. I'm just, my eyes are wet and burning. Wait, wait, let me get my Kleenex, okay. Eyes wet and burning. I came with the tools because I knew y'all were gonna make this happen. So uh, <laughs> anyway, it's just incredible to um, be reading with y'all and anyway. Um, and uh, congratulations, Francine. Yes, sometimes they get that shit right. Okay, so Joy, I got a new poem. It's called For Joy Down in My Heart, okay? Just letting you know it's coming. All right. Happy to be with all y'all. Um, break me and I'll sing. My voice like marrow, a blood yolk spilled upon the counter. You can't stop this song. More hands than yours have closed around my throat. You may crack me. You have cracked me. I'm frightened, but so what? I'll testify. Witness, if you can listen, I slurped the frog leg soup gone bad. Held a brass spoon like a barrel to my mouth. I could tell you what you want to hear, but I'd be broken just the same, so why not sing? I'm singing now, louder this time, and in the round, we are a wounding of red plume birds, every voice a bloody feather in the bone crown. I've worn it three days in a row for Elaine. The dress my mother died in. No, the dress I was wearing when my mother died, and I took pictures of myself self, no, of the dress, of my legs curled tight under the dress, only my ankles and feet showing. I held my arm up and back and did not want to show my head, my swollen eyes and chapped lips, all that dried salt on my face, my face, she could not bear to look at unless it was with disgust. My hair, never good, no good, and my unironed dress like this one I am wearing now with its white cotton underslip and its red embroidered paisley on a white background. It is beautiful, even with me in it. Yes, I am not wearing a hat. She said, you look so ugly in that hat. It was my favorite one of three hats. She had over 100 hats stored in her basement in labeled hat boxes, they were her particular thing. Every Sunday, a new one, perched proudly as a bird of paradise, though only the males are so presentable. But she was a tomboy once, and so was her mother. She hated my teacups and my dollies that I couldn't sleep without, like I slept that day when I found out she had died. I lay fetal upon the bed atop the duvet and wanted to live and felt guilt like a razor over the wrist. You always were odd and carrying on. You talked too much. You were a mess and I was a mess. My chest wet and my heart shrinking in and I was shrinking and this was good. She was always a small woman, except for 10 years when she grew past what her small frame could hold. Who can say why her hunger grew and why she hated my hunger to be held and so recoiled and I went days and days without any touch at all and I have gone days and days since ugly in my hat. Even my father thought so. 
though now he isn't sure. Since she died, so much has changed. Even this dress, now stained by wear and coffee and crying, and now the pills won't let me, and now and again sleeping in it, and just last night keeping it on for dinner alone at the same counter where I was when I found out she had died a few minutes after our last phone call when she couldn't see me and so could afford to love me. When your brother dies, you want nothing more than to be held by your brother and within that absence to be held by another. It will take that to cry it through. And if there is no one to do so, if there is an embrace, but it does not last long enough, you may never feel the joy of wailing. Instead, you may hold that cry for years until no one knew you ever needed to cry at all, until you believe you are free of tears, until one day standing at the sink, the water running hot over your knuckles, you double over. And that long held cry escapes in a gasp, a memory of that other body in convulsion in the sick bed or the street. The smell of death so close, you forget there are people with you in the room and you almost let go before someone reminds you that day is done and there is work to do. So you straighten up and continue to do whatever it was you were doing. Close the valve of ache and swallow whatever came up. Thank you. And thank you, Tarfia, very much. Wow, that was incredible. Thank you so much, Ivy. Thank you so much. Well, I could listen to y'all all day, to be honest. And we have plenty of time, paradoxically. Um, do y'all have questions? I have a question I would like to start with, which is if y'all would be willing to share some gesture or movement towards health that you've made recently. Tarfia, mm. mm. you're not gonna give us a poll? No, I'm the moderator. The moderators, the moderators don't do poems. Okay. Mm. Mm, we need to change some rules. Right. Mm. Uh, as soon as she said that, I thought about privilege and access. Because any gesture I've made towards health recently has to do with access. Like I'm buying a house right now, access, even though it feels healthy. And I got vaccinated, which is access. And I just won this fucking award, which feels healthy, but also privilege, access. I'm gonna have to think about <laughs> the rest of that answer, but that's the first thing that I thought about. Because not everybody is, has access to any of those things. And, you know. And, and I've been, I, I think about health all the time because um, I've been um, sick since um, uh, 2019, uh, mid to end 2019. So um, as a result, I'm in physical pain all the time. But so uh, that access is interesting because um, had I had access earlier, had I not been, uh, misdiagnosed and mistreated, um, I wouldn't be in this pain now. So I'm thinking about my health, but it always comes with a great deal of uh, rage mm -hmm. and not being able to turn around. And th there's no one I can um, grab to say, you did this to me. There's no way I can prove it really, although, even my doctors know it to be true. So I, I, I am loving this uh, period, the second reckoning, if you will. And I'm hoping that those younger than myself and healthier than myself will keep this 
up and going and pushing um, so that you, you, we don't have to keep dealing with um, being at risk all the time or mm -hmm. health at risk. By the time we get access, our health has already been uh, betrayed, undermined. Right. What you say, Joy? <laughs> um, man, I, the past year has been, well, maybe for all of us, but uh, for me personally, I mean, I've never thought about my own health so much um, mm -hmm. because of the larger collective moment we're going through, but also, um, you know, I put out my first book in the midst of that and mm -hmm. my program at the same time and so many other things. Um, I don't talk about this publicly, mostly because of my parents, but I uh, stopped drinking 88 days ago. Um, I stopped doing everything, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. days of sobriety. But um, I've had to make some really, really drastic, difficult choices to maintain my health. And I thought like the biggest one was the was sobriety, but it's turned out that in sobriety, I'm realizing the biggest gesture I've made toward health is um, boundaries, like learning how to to uh, honor my boundaries, mostly with men, <laughs> um, because um, if I don't, resentment builds up, and mm -hmm. uh, and so instead of getting angry with everyone else, why, why don't they know I'm tired? You know, I'm in a PhD. I know y'all seen me. I went off on Twitter about it before, but don't they know I'm in a PhD? A book came out. I don't have no time to myself. I'm, you know, I have a heart condition, blah, 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 blah. Instead of being mad at everyone else, I just have to like honor my boundaries. So I'm working on, you know, a big gesture of health is working on, um, you know, not going through this in internal monologue, this replay over and over again about what other people think of me because I said no, or because I asserted my boundaries. Um, you know, it's really just the interior, the, the, the big gesture toward health has been the interior work. Um, you know, that was corny, but I love it so much. Meditation, um, and uh, just went out, walk into a chapel about a mile away and listening, just listen, closing my eyes and acknowledging sounds. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been so overwhelming. Like a first book is so overwhelming. And I, I feel like I was, um, I was kind of taken by surprise about it because no one really, I don't know, maybe people do talk about it, but I hadn't heard, I hadn't heard many people talk about how um, overwhelming releasing a first book is and you know, the, you know, time doesn't slow down for you when you're trying to learn how to balance everything uh, as a working writer, as a working writer who has a whole other life, you know, um, and now you gotta like, now the book becomes like this second full-time job. And um, unless, you know, you, you, you choose the hermit route, which. Meg, are you going to say something? You're going to share a health a health gesture. Uh, yeah. I mean, well, I'm kind of like I think realizing this year that I conflate ideas like being successful or being happy with being healthy, and kind of just thinking about how to separate those things has been important to me. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't really have an articulate <laughs> way to say right now that I've been sort of gesturing toward my health, but um, it just reminds me of something I read a while ago about, and some of y'all probably know where this came from. I don't remember, but it was like a thing that said, you have to, in your life, you really get to choose two of four things to focus on. And there's uh, health, your work, your family, and your friends. And like, you can only really sustain two in, in like a strong way. And I think I've always chosen like my work and my friends. And um, 
you know, just this year of like being isolated and um, I don't know, it's given me a lot of time to think about uh, where my priorities are and um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's all I have. Can I say something, Tarfia? Uh, maybe the, 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 the way that I wanna uh, redress or reapproach what I said about the poems that I chose, because I guess I kind of want to take it back to writing. Um, I, I chose the poems that I chose because I was thinking about the ways in which they address elements beyond my control, <laughs> like rap songs that I can't stop boogieing to, but actually kind of make me feel like shit, <laughs> or um, uh, strange experiences of feeling endangered in public, um, that dude on the train that was walking around putting his fingers to people's head, you know? Or um, I don't even remember what the other one was. Oh, cat calling, what the first poem was about. So I guess I kind of wanted to take it back to the idea of writing and language as a way of trying to shape our own realities and um, using language as a way to see our imaginations transformed or manifest. I just wanted to say that because I think it, I think it's that to me that's an act of health as well. Mm -hmm. Thank y'all. Those answers are incredible. I'll be thinking about them for the rest of the day. Does anybody in the chat in our wonderful studio audience have any questions? Okay, I have a question to Francine from Violet Augustine. Hi, Violet. Is this a question in the making? <laughs> it, it appears to be a question in the making. Okay, here we are. A process of giving, I'm sorry, I'm not actually looking at the chat. Um, do you have to go through a process of giving yourself permission to write that way? Um, yeah, probably. I think it's some, sometimes, right? But I don't know that it's any kind of like, I think we all, I think all writers do to some extent because shit comes into your head that you are like, should I put that down? <laughs> right? I was thinking about that a lot with Ivy's poems. Um, particularly the poem about your brother and the first poem about the hat. Um, I kept thinking like, I wonder if when, you know, w at what point the hat become became the object of all that emotional weight. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, I, I was thinking that about your poems. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not, I don't know that it's, I wonder why you're asking that. <laughs> what, is, why do, what do you mean? Like, why, why does that matter? Why does the permission, permission from whom? Permission uh, from like. Can I elaborate? Sorry. It would be easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sorry, my, my kid was like. That's okay. Was typing. Um, I ask because, you know, it's not like the way that we're taught to write in grad school or in mm -hmm. college. And like, I recently started um, trying to write the way that I speak um, and mm -hmm. like with English and Spanish. And like, mm -hmm. I'm 36 years old and it took me until I was 36 to write right. the way that I speak because it's not what I was taught in school. And right. your poem was so powerful and just so beautiful and so full of music. And it just, I just wondered like, did you always have that confidence or did you go through a process of like, Saying, the comfort of it yeah like I'm gonna write this way even if you know my fourth grade English teacher would have definitely said that that I can't write that way I hope I'm making sense yeah no you you're making perfect sense I think you know we I mean in a way your your answer is in your question which is that we have to give ourselves permission to ha find the beauty of our own music our own language I love joy because she makes this argument you know, Joy is my class. You make this argument every week, every week. <laughs> you have to find, like, you have to give yourself permission 
to love the language that moves you, right? Like it doesn't matter. Um, feedback and cr critique is you can only really like take what other people say to you as feedback, not as the right way. It's only a thought in, right? It, feedback, input, whatever. That's only a thought in like, your audiences are always gonna change. <laughs> I'll, I'll stay succinct because I mean, maybe other folks wanna. Can I um, add a comment? Um, yeah, please. We have about four minutes left, but I, was I just think that's great. It's concise. I was just gonna say it's important that you have, that the, the educational, educational institutions of this country not be the only education you have as a writer. Right. That's right. Um, Absolutely. I was like uh, blessed to grow up in a, um, you know, the latter part of my adolescence in a community where I went to an all black school, I went to a black church and et cetera, et cetera. So all of that was part of my education as a writer and, the, and the, how I use language. And so per, the, the, the need for permission wasn't there when I started sending out work, you know. Right. Vivi or Mag, would you like to share any thoughts related to that? Well, I, I was thinking about all the ways people told me I couldn't write. Um, you know, and but it 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 was in inside intercultural too because um, one of the reasons I began writing and, and teaching of a sort as well is because so many people who were black older than me kept telling me what a black writer should write about or right. what a black writer was and my responses were visceral and immediate because i won't be told or bounded in that way as far as craft goes i love learning craft i love learning poetic history i could talk about the line and line breaks all day long but when it comes to what i'm going to to write um or what's normative then i'm, I'm going to nod to the rules and i'm, I'm going to break what i feel like breaking and it's the breaking historically inside of poetry that that opens things up. So that 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 was my my first that 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 decision of where those you're bounded by someone else's conventions, you know, happens all the time. You, you could spend the rest of your life pushing back against them. Um, so institutionally and otherwise. Wow. Thank you all so much for sharing thoughts. Mag, do you have anything to add? Yeah, our, I was gonna kind of also combine it with a question from the chat box about like, how do you write when the, how do you write honestly when the truth might hurt your family or friends? Um, Cause I mean, that's something that you guys probably noticed I do. Um, I talk about my dad's crack addiction. I talk about, you know, uh, especially situations with family that have been painful and it took me a long time to realize that telling the truth in my poems didn't change the fact of the truth. You know, whether I did or did not put it in my poem, the damage that my dad's addiction caused in the family and, um, and the damage um, that it still causes, it's, it would be there regardless of whether it's in my poems. And if I am expected to kind of give him forgiveness to proceed with our relationship, then I should be allowed to expect him to forgive me for speaking the truth, mm. you know? And if he can't do that, um, that goes back to boundaries, um, like Joy said. So luckily, I mean, right now, it's worked out for me in terms of the relationships in my family and with friends. And it's not like, you know, I'm a vengeful writer. I write the truth and I write to explore and to uh, discover things that are true. So it's not like there's an agenda there, but I would never censor myself um, 
merely because I need to defer to someone else's happiness if it is in fact the truth. Thank you all so much for those wonderful answers. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you to everybody, to Sandaria and all the organizers of the Dallas Literary Festival. And I hope you all have a really beautiful Saturday, wherever you are. You too, Tarfia. I love you guys. Love you all so much. Bye. One panel.